Okay, good morning to everybody there and uh, welcome again to our Friday seminar series. We used to have the face-to-face -face one, which was very successful. Now we have the webinar. Hopefully this will be successful. It's been constant. And uh, today we're fortunate we have uh, Dr. Bubakoba from um, uh, the Cape. And he is Chairman Research Chair of Mathematics with specialization in data science, which is an uh, important and growing area uh, in South Africa and the rest of the world. He's head of AIM South Africa Data Science Research Group, also has a position in the Department of Mathematical Sciences at Stellenbosch University. So he, um, his talk today is going to be on, as you see on the screen, I hope everybody can see the screen. If not, please uh, indicate so. And of course, if you can, uh, if the audio is fine, I think from, I can hear him quite clearly and I hope everything goes well. Please, Dr. Bach, you should start. Seminar. Okay, thank you very much, Faisal. Um, thank you, for your whoever is responsible at Koimas for inviting me here. Uh, I think Karen was doing this. And thank you for the kind introduction there, Faisal. Yeah, I'm going to talk to you about uh, an integer programming approach to deep neural networks with binary activations. So let's get started. That's the outline of my talk. I'll just give a brief introduction where I show you a couple of things about deep learning and then do a, a kind of preliminary discussion on deep neural networks and about some concepts and some notations. And then I'll go into the meat of this talk, which is about binary deep neural networks, how we train them, the different variants you can make out of them and some computations we did to compare them to deep neural networks and that will conclude our talk today okay so this is joint work with Yanis Kurtz who is at Sagan University uh, when we started the work he was at RWTH Aachen he now moved to uh, Sagan all right so let me tell you a bit about this so as introduction, I just want to point out a couple of success stories of deep learning. Um, for many people, this is now well known, but uh, maybe not well known, especially to the maths community. But uh, there are many, many success stories that deep learning is, 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 is bringing to us. It has revolutionized our mach uh, machine learning in general. And so one example is this uh, self-driving cars. So they're in some controlled environments now in, in some developed countries where this is actually working, you know, and the algorithms behind the operation of these cars are deep neural networks. So they are being useful. Probably something closer to us is this uh, machine translation, you know, um, you go to Google, uh, you can translate uh, anything you want to translate, right? You know, like most, most, especially most international languages now you can translate. And, and there was a group in South Africa actually that developed some translation uh, engine for languages in South Africa, for instance. So translation is, 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 is also using deep learning, a lot of deep learning behind it, okay? Also, medical diagnostics, you know, finding uh, diseases, uh, trying try to diagnose uh, certain kinds of diseases or many other different kinds of things in the, me in the medical field and, and, and health fields. There's a lot of use of, of, of deep learning and uh, neural networks. So there's a motivation to understand this area, uh, no doubt, because it has a potential to contribute significantly to our society now and going forward. Okay, but it has a lot of challenges. Despite all these opportunities, there are a lot of challenges. And one that is closer to us as a maths community is the absence of mathematics. And there's this uh, popular uh, uh, mathematician, Ingrid Debussy, most of you would know, you know, the Debussy wavelet, all right? She's the guy. She says that in a recent article that mat machine learning works spectacularly well, but mathematicians aren't quite sure why, okay? 
And we are always sure when we can write it, we can work out the theory behind it and we are satisfied with the theory. So the theory is, is a minefield. There's a lot of mathematics to be done there. So this is a, a, a call to you as a maths community to think about these problems, okay? And this problem I'm presenting here is just one of the problems. So actually this uh, work you could consider as a step towards solving this problem of absence of mathematics in this field. But there are other challenging issues that uh, generally we can also talk about like high dimensionality because the data sets we deal with are very huge, you know, and in maths we are familiar with these things about course and course of dimensionality. And of course there's also a blessing of dimensionality that has been coined recently. But yeah, there is a trade off that people need to understand. Okay. There is a lot of problems with the data itself, you know, it's like this heterogeneity and incompleteness in the data, there could be missing data, data comes in different formats, you know, the scale is, is another thing, these are massive data sets, you know, much, much uh, uh, larger than what statisticians would usually deal with, you know, and machine learning and deep learning is usually a practical area, people want to apply this to solve real life problems, and in that case, well, getting a nice theorem is good but finding a way to implement thing and it work is also more important okay so there are people who are who want to do maths in this area should understand these trade-offs also there is ethics of course is a big one there privacy security bias and many other ethical concerns that people can also work on okay i left out a couple that would i'll bring in in, in, in a separate slide one of them is explainability Deep learning algorithms are black boxes, more or less, okay? And this is a problem, you know? Here is a chart trying to show you, you know, these are like most of the learning techniques, you know, the deep learning techniques, decision trees, random forest, Markov models, you know, SVMs, deep learning and neural nets, okay? And here's a kind of an explainability notion graph that says that, you know, as, you know, these, these algorithms, people are interested in how accurate they do predictions, you know. As the predictions increase, you would follow this, uh, uh, this axis, and this is explainability increasing would follow that uh, uh, arrow in the, in, the, in the horizontal axis. So you see uh, different algorithms have different accuracies. Of course, this is why people like deep learning algorithms, they are super, uh, accurate, they're super powerful, they perform much better. You can see their accuracy level is much higher. But then their explainability level is also very small compared to others, okay? So they become bigger and bigger black boxes that people cannot explain. And this is a problem, you know? I give you a real life example, like you wanna apply a loan at a bank, you go to the bank and they ask you to fill some information. This is the data they collect from you and then they run an algorithm and the algorithm tells you that you're not qualified to get a loan. You know, this is not satisfactory to a customer, right? You want to know why, you know? So they may, the algorithm is doing something that the agent, the banking agent himself may not be able to explain to you. So this is not satisfactory. This is why there's a drive to have explainability in machine learning algorithms. And this work attempts to find a solution to that among all many other works. There's also robustness, you know? We, this is in, in mathematics or numeric analysis, we call this instability, for instance, you know, the algorithms are not robust to perturbations. When you put up the input a little bit, they could have something else could happen in the output, okay, which is serious instability. And then there was this article in the, in, in the BBC that says computers can be made to see a C total as a gun or here a concerno as someone's voice, you know, depending on, 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 on just some little bit of perturbations of the input. Actually, this small, the, the, the smaller picture at the corner was the case where uh, uh, the people are able to fool driverless cars, for instance, okay? Self-driving cars would recognize a stop sign and they would stop. But people realize that if you strategically place these black and white patches on this, on this stop sign, they would fail to re recognize it as a stop sign. So this is a perturbation in the input that leads to a, 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 a significant change in the output that uh, uh, can, can, can have serious consequences in the real world, okay? So therefore, we see our work in an attempt to solve this problem too, okay? So those are two challenges that we can directly say could be solved in this setting. And I'll explain as we go along. 
So first of all, to set the notation and the perspective, we're talking about supervised learning. What is supervised learning? You, you, you want to learn a map uh, between your inputs and your outputs, OK? So you would be given a set of data points. Sometimes it's called a training set, you know, if you like. You know, let's say we have M of them. So it will be X's and the Y's. So the X's are your input. They are typically called features. And the Y's are your targets or your labels, OK? Then the, the function you want to learn is a map. So we, it's usually called a hypothesis, a map, or a function. But typically, you hear people say models, OK? So this is the H you are you're concerned with, yeah, OK? And you, what you think of is, is that your Y's are the H plus some noise, OK? So you want to come up with predict, land predictors of YI, that would be your H, in such a way that they, they are very close to your level, the known levels, if not exactly those, OK? And to know this H, all we need to know is this parameter vector, OK, this theta, OK? In the settings where, where H is a linear model, for instance, you can write it as an inner product between theta and x. In that case, we say we, we, the, the model is linear and we do things like linear regression or least squares and all these kinds of stuff. But this is not the subject of this talk. We will talk we'll mainly be talking about nonlinear models, actually. But then how do you find this parameter? First, you want to minimize a loss function, OK? The loss function finds how close your predictions, this H is, or your model or your, your map is close to the actual levels, OK? It tries to minimize this, like a risk, empirical risk minimization problem, OK? So that's the setup we are looking at. We are looking at a supervised learning setup, but we are using deep learning in that, in the, to solve this problem. So deep learning, like I said, is not a linear model. It's a nonlinear model. But it's, it's inspired. It is correct to say it's inspired by how brain, our brain processes information. Okay, Our brain is composed of neurons like that. Okay, And all of them are interconnected. And neurons send neurons to other neurons through the dendrites they come in. And the processing of, of the signals are, is done in the nucleus of the, of the neuron. And neurons then, a neuron then can decide to fire or not to fire. To fire means to send the signal forward. To, so these things are connected to another neuron. Okay, So it would fire forward. Okay? But why, how it decides to fire or not to fire, we try to model as some kind of a threshold function. We say when all these signals come in from different neurons, they must pass a certain threshold. If they do, then the neuron will fire. So you try to mimic that. And this was done in 1943. So it's something that people started studying a long time ago. You know, you think of the neuron signals coming in as this X, uh, X1 to Xn from more connection from other neurons being these this weights. You know, so if a neuron sends a signal, the weight is non-zero. If it doesn't send anything, we say, think of the name, the, the weight as something else, okay? So this W are the weights. Again, this is related to what we just talked about, the parameter vector before. These are parameters, if you like, okay? So they are aggregated here. I use the summation to say they are aggregated. And then you want them to say that there's a threshold theta. When you go beyond that threshold, then there's something that is, uh, uh, the signal is sent to the other neuron, okay? So this is, the mathematics here. And this is very similar to our linear model, remember? H theta of x we saw before is an inner product between the weights or the parameters and the inputs. OK? So this is exactly. But the only thing is something changes here. OK? Not only that you have, it's, 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 not only that you have H out and then we take that, but we want this threshold to be satisfied. OK? And there are different models of how do we make this satisfied. This is the nonlinearity we are talking about in, in the neural network setup. OK? So if you take those little, uh, these things, and stack them up, and even make more connections to other neurons, you would have what is so. So one of these single ones would be called a, a perceptron, for instance. That's the name that it was given uh, by uh, Malloc, Maclock and Pitts in, in, in 1943. OK? So these are neurons, like I said, remember, each, each node is representing a neuron, OK? So if we can stack these neurons together into layers, we have what we call a neural network, OK? Or a multi-layer perceptron. So the single one is a perceptron. You can, if you have many, many of them stacked in this way, we say it's a multi-layer perceptron, or we call it a, 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 a neural network. 
It could be deep or it could be shallow. If it's just two layers, one, two, one in the middle and then an output, we say it's a shallow uh, uh, neural network. But if it's more than two, generally we refer to it as a deep neural network. So this is why I call it D DNN, okay? So what happens, you have this input layer where these other neurons are firing to other neurons. Think of this, our data, our input data, our features X, I, and then they go in. So you do this diplet W that you learn are the parameters here. Do you learn a different set of Ws here? Another different set of Ws here, another different set of Ws there. And what happens is before you fire, it must pass through, it must satisfy some threshold. Then some number is outputted here, which is the signal, okay? If it's zero, then there's no signal going away. If it's more than zero, then a signal is sent forward. That is multiplied by the set of weights here. And this is propagated forward, okay? And the output layer is now, this should be your prediction, your H, remember? It is your Y hat. We would call it Y hat. We haven't said so that here now. But then this is your H. It's your last layer, okay? So it's called the output layer. The input layer is your data. The output layer is your predictions. These predictions, you want to be as close as possible to the levels for your targets, the Ys, okay? But these layers in between, since we usually don't see the outputs, are called hidden layers, okay? So there could be more, you know, than three, you know. So they could go on. In fact, deep naps now, I think they are. So this is this is this is really, really where the problem when we talk about these are really high dimensional and deep uh, and involve many, many parameters because these nets can be in millions of layers, okay? In millions of layers, literally, yes. So this can be very can have huge number of parameters when we talk about a number of parameters. But again, so now deep learning, it's like any machine learning algorithm, but then you say it's, it's a linear, in, instead of a linearity, we have this uh, non-linearity. So we solve it by solving the same problem that we saw in the linear model, except that you should take a note that this Y hats now involves some non-linearity. That's the only difference. So we do risk minimization as before. And how do we do that? We try to solve this problem. And typically solving this problem is what is called the training or the learning, okay? And to do this learning, you do a, a forward and a backward propagation. This is because this backward propagation uses some uh, well-known algorithm, the, the gradient descent to solve this problem. Instead of finding, typically there's no closed form solution. So that's out of the question. And so the thing is you iteratively solve this problem. And this iteration is what leads to forward and backward propagation. So first you set the weights. Let's say you randomly generate initialization in this case, if you're coming from numerical analysis, you randomly generate some weights first to start with, and then multiply them to your, to your input, get, a, uh, get something in your these nodes, pass them through a nonlinearity because they need to pass this uh, threshold, right? So pass that through those, that threshold. If it's uh, greater than zero, some information is passed forward multiply by those wait, wait matrices, repeat the process here, do that until you get to the last layer. This is called the forward propagation. When you get to the last layer, you have an output, which is called the predictions or your hypothesis, okay? Then you take this H and see how close it is to your Y, okay? Or this Y hat and see how close it's to your Y in average, on average, okay? If this is too far, the error you're making is too large, then you say, I want to go and improve on my weights so that I get a better, I get a closer Y hat to my Y. Okay, this process of improving is, is what you would uh, use gradient descent to do. You say my weights or my parameters theta is what I get when you, when you do this force sweep and get there, okay, or the, the sweep at time T, you get these parameters T, uh, theta T. And then you, now you want new parameters. So therefore these parameters are theta T plus one would be what the parameters were at theta T minus some step size eta, as we call it in mathematics. In, 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 in machine learning, they would call this a learning rate times the gradient. This is like making a step in the negative gradient direction. This is exactly what we do. We know in numerical analysis, exactly. So it's a simple first order method that you use to solve this problem. And this is why you do backward and, and forward. Then when you get this theta plus one, then you multiply again uh, with your new weights to see what H you get. This means another forward propagation if you are not satisfied, you do this step again and compute a new, new set of parameters, repeat the process over and over until you are satisfied with the loss you are getting. Then that's your training, you, you finish your training, you take that theta, that is the theta that is your, your model actually, because your model only needs the parameters. When you get the parameters, you are done. So uh, that's a quick crash course, crash course on, on deep learning. 
Now let's look at what we're talking about in terms of mathematics, okay? So this y hat I mentioned, so is this h that you get, what is that supposed to be? This is, x, so you take the force, I mean, think of the force layer as w1 here, the second layer w2, this up superscript two, okay? And the same thing and so on, okay? So w1 times x would be the force layer. You need this to go through to meet some threshold before an output is made. That is captured by a nonlinear function we would call sigma, and it's called an activation function you would see in a moment. You would multiply that output to W2, which is in the second layer, and we'll pass that through another activation function, multiply that by W3, pass through another activation function, uh, sigma three in that case, and you keep doing that until the number of layers that you have, like K in this case. You have K layers, this is what is gonna happen. So X is your original input for data point. Uh, they are in RN in, for this work. And we are dealing with K layers, capital K layers. And these are the weight matrices. These are the parameters that we saw for, for each layer. We have a weight matrix. So this is layer K. Okay, K denotes the K layer. And each K, each layer would have a dimension D. Okay. Each layer would have a dimension, each layer K would have a dimension DK. Okay. So here you put all these uh, parameters together. W1 to WK, this would give you the set of parameters, which is the theta we saw earlier, okay? It was a vector, but it could be a set of parameters, okay? And I said these uh, sigmas are activation functions. They are nonlinear and they act component-wise. So if you give an input, which is a vector, they will act on, on the different components of the vector. If it's a matrix, they will act on different components of the matrix, okay? How am I doing in time? Okay, that's, that's, that's fine. So essentially now what the problem is, remember I said now the, to solve the problem, we, we minimize some function, okay? We minimize the loss function, okay? I write it here like we saw earlier. There was one over M here, don't worry about that. It's not I'm gonna affect our solution because we're interested in the theta that gives the minimum solution, okay? This would stay the same whether you multiply this loss function or this objective by a constant or not. It doesn't change that. So this is what you do, you minimize over the sum of all losses that you make over your data set. And you wanna condition that subject to this, that this y i hat is this nonlinear or this composition of functions. So you have an affine transformation, w times x, and you pass that from a nonlinearity. So you have an affine transformation and other nonlinearities. So it's a composition of functions, okay? And we mentioned that each of these WKs are in this uh, dimension WK by the DK by DK minus one, okay? So in, for instance, when we are doing a classification where you have a, a discrete output in this setting, we know this in a, in a regression, you have a continuous out, uh, output. In the, in the classification, you have a discrete output. That means that the Ys that you are gonna have are gonna have discrete uh, values, okay? If it's like, two categories, it will be like zero, one, okay? So the training data, we will be giving training data, we assume X1 to Xm of them, the Xs are in dimension N, but these Ys are in zero, one, okay? And then you wanna find this loss function that would be mapping the zero, one by DK to, to, to R. So this is what is this loss function is gonna give us. And there are many loss functions, but in, in, in classifications, typically we talk about those two, you can do an LP loss, you can, where well, peak could be one or two typically, but also you can do the cross entropy law, loss, which is this one, okay? And then I mentioned this activation from the nonlinear. Remember, we want it to pass some threshold, right? A threshold would be like a heavy side function, like a step function, okay? But the way we solve the problem you saw, it's, it's gradient descent, we need to compute gradients, okay? And we cannot differentiate these step functions. So people came up with different kinds of activation functions. And one of them is a sigmoid, which also looks like a step function, except that it goes between zero and one, okay? And it's zero at half. There is the tangent hyperbolic function, which is similar, but it goes from minus one to one, and it is zero at zero, okay? Then you have what is called the ReLU rectifier linear unit, which sets things to zero, things that are negative to zero, and leave orders as they are, okay? So it's the max of zero and its value, okay? So those, those are just three, but there are many, many more, and different variants of uh, ReLU, like leaky ReLU, 
There is, like I mentioned, the heavy side function, which is the step function. Um, there are many, many, many more. There's a hard tangent one also that people talk about. So there are many, many more activation functions, but this is just an example. Okay. The binary neural networks, what is the difference with, with deep nets? The only difference is the activation function is, is, is particular, it's unique. It's, it's trying to mimic the real uh, activation function that you would have when you want a neuron to fire. This is like gonna be like a step function, a heavy side function. You say that sigma alpha k would be one if alpha is less than zero. Here you're assuming that uh, you have maybe done some little transformation and you know the threshold is part of what you're solving. So therefore it's, it's something minus the threshold is zero and this is fine. So alpha involves that thing. So you can say alpha zero and later in the, in the talk also that you, you don't have to have alpha to be less than zero. You could, it could be less than something that you could also learn like a, a lambda or something, okay? But let's say in, the, in, the, in the, our case, we are able to do some transformation and we will gonna get this setting where when alpha is zero, this is zero and alpha is non is greater than or equal to zero, it outputs one, okay? This is the setting we are looking at, okay? For the binary deep net. So we are not using those, any of these guys, we are just using the step function, okay? Okay? And it has very nice properties, okay? Um, so I mentioned earlier that uh, we have issues of uh, um, explainability, okay? Um, I should have added that here actually. So now the fact that, you know, these are binary values, the output of the binary deep neural network is gonna be binary. You can clearly know, you remember these thetas are inner products or so you can these Ws uh, times your thing and your output of activation function would be some numbers that you can clearly know which of the features it is selecting and which is the feature it is not selecting for instance. And this is what you would want to hear when you are, for instance, in front of a banker and they tell you, you are not qualified to apply because when we looked at your data, it seems it shows that maybe you have not been paying your loans. You are, you, are, you are not credit worthy, for instance, your credit report was poor, you know. And then you would hope that a neural network well-trained, when trained, will assign a very important parameter to this uh, feature than other features, okay? So this is this is this this would help in explainability when we use uh, binary neural network. But the other thing is it consumes less memory. Another challenge that I didn't mention. Well, I implied when I said, look, these things can be very high dimensional, but not only high dimensional. The solutions sometimes we aim for a high resolution, and these things pre pre present memory challenges. Okay, so to have overcome those things, if you use a binary neural network, this is the extreme case of of, 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 of uh, quantization, okay? If something is, uh, is of high resolution, you quantize it to reduce the, the resolution. So the, the, the extreme resolution is the zero, is the one bit uh, resolution, this is zero one. So binary neural networks keep on these things. And the, the thing is, if we have a train a model binary neural network, we should be able to easily load it in a, in a low resource device like a mobile phone, and it can still run because it need, would need re, require less memory. I talked about this non-robust net adversarial noise or, or, or generally noise. So we saw the issue where the, the, the cars would fail to recognize the stop sign because these are strategically located place stickers. This is called an adversarial attack. You know that if you put certain noise in a particular location or certain perturbations, this would make the whole thing fail. This is an adversarial attack, okay? So it turned out that these kinds of networks are a bit more robust to adversarial attacks than the general deep neural networks, okay? Of course, they have issues because of, of, of this course quantization, they become less accurate and less complex, of course, okay? So that's something you have to pay for. Okay, how do you train this deep neural network? There's a lot of work uh, out there, not a lot, but there's some work out there trying to understand this. People studied this a while ago. Okay, we didn't start it. You know, people try to actually use the same gradient descents to solve this problem. And so they, in order to, 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 to mimic the, uh, the continuous setting, they try to use stochastic binarization of weights, they would approximate the, for the back propagation, they approximate the binary activation function by some continuous functions like this one, for instance, you know, so everything like your differentiation would work and everything because you replace 
the binary function by something that is close, not quite binary, okay? But there are actually methods that actually use, well, try to solve the binary problem. And um, uh, there's this work in 2018, which is, so it's, it's becoming active very recently. From 2018 to now, a couple of papers has come up. There are others that came up in 2020, I'm not showing here, but a couple more, a couple of papers that showed up, okay? Uh, so, so this group was interested in evaluation of trained deep network with radio activation using uh, uh, these uh, mixed integer linear programs. Okay, so mixed integer linear programs are one of the frameworks for these binary networks. And this group started looking at that. They didn't train them; they were just going to take a trained network and say, "Now, if you were to replace the radio with uh, a binary network, is this?" gonna have the similar result, similar results as using the ReLU, for instance. And there are people who are interested in calculating adversarial samples for trained BDNN using actually these methods. And we also claim that our method or our results could be used to calculate uh, these adversarial examples. In fact, this is an extension of our work that we are currently working on. And this group also started now actually training the, the, the BDNN using an MLP. So ours was in this direction, a similar work, but we use different techniques and different, and different solutions, okay? Okay, so how do you formulate the training problem as a binary, uh, uh, a mixed, mixed integer programming uh, problem, okay? So the binary deep network uh, is, is, is equivalent to solving this problem, okay? Remember what we said earlier, we minimize the loss. The loss, what is the loss? Here we're talking about binary, you know, we have a binary output. If you use the indicator function, the indicator function ret returns one when what is in here is, is true and it returns zero otherwise, okay? Remember, this is what you predict, y hat is what you predict. You want those predictions to be the same as your labels. When they are the same, you should have a zero in the, in, in the error, okay? So when they are not the same, you should have one, okay? That's exactly what we're trying to mimic here, okay? And then what you say is subject to this condition we saw earlier, it's not new, this is this thing. Uh, this is not new, we saw all this. We say this can be done by solving a mixed linear integer, mixed integer linear programming uh, formulation of polynomial size. And you will see why we emphasize this polynomial size because when things are exponential, you cannot solve them anymore because they become so large. And again, here, one, one thing we can say is, uh, a remark we can make is that these Ws, they can be real or binary, okay? In some of the works that I said earlier, they were solving the problems where they fix these Ws to be binary. So every, the whole problem is binarized because the activations are binary and the, the weights are binary. But in our formulation, you can do, do both real and binary and still solve, have, have a good solution. Okay, so let me try to sketch the proof uh, of, 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 of this. So you can rewrite the indicator function by introducing new binary variables u, okay? You say that I will have the summation of the u's for which, for the i's which yi is zero, and the summation of one minus u for the i's with the y i's is one, okay? And then I can rewrite my constraints before, you know, remember this activation functions only output a zero or a one, okay? I can say, in the first instance, I'm going to do the, the force weight matrix times my input is bounded above by this M1 times my binary variable for the force uh, layer, okay? And what is this M1 you will start asking? So this is uh, a well-developed method now, and people are making a lot of research in this area in, in, in integer programming or mixed integer programming. And this is called the big M notation method, okay? Or the, the big M method. So what you do is you say, I'm gonna come look, set these large numbers, these Ms, okay? As my constraint. Instead of leaving something unconstrained, you are a constraint that essentially is not a constraint giving other conditions, okay? So let's see, if, if your U is zero, okay? You multiply this to that, then you're saying that this thing should be negative, okay? But if this is large and u is one, then what you are saying that this can be essentially anything, okay? It's not constrained. And this is the thing you do, okay? For m is equals to one, for m equals two, or to m equals to k, okay? 
So you can see now why we say polynomial time, polynomial size is important because remember, these are many, right? So K is, is, is you have for each, for each K, you have a two sets of linear systems, okay? Linear constraints. And these sets, each of them has dimension one. Remember, this, is, this may depend on DK, okay? DK, which is the diamond, DK by DK minus one, which is the dimension of your, of, of your weight matrix. Okay, so this can easily grow very, very huge. Okay, you don't, so therefore in polynomial time, you may, you may, you may be able to handle this. And you, you would see in our computations, we, we, we did very low dimensions because of this. Okay, so this is called the BM uh, method in, in, in mixed integer linear programming. Okay, so essentially when you do this, you're done. The next thing, so you have written uh, these here, this, this constraint, one, this here into a set of linear constraints, okay? Into a set of linear constraints. And now we are ready to solve a mixed integer linear program, okay? What you may say, okay, still there are some quadratic terms. This W uh, times the UJ, UJs could be quadratic because you're learning, remember you're learning the Ws and the Us, okay? All right, so what you do then, you can, you can do a change of variable and replace this W, the products by these Ss. And then you want to enforce that uh, the, the constraints uh, you had earlier. To do that, you want to have this extra constraints on the S's, okay? And that's all. Then you have just, uh, you have a few more constraints added to the ones you have. So the problem grows, but it still becomes a linear problem to solve, okay? And yeah, that's it. You are ready to solve a, a mixed integer linear program, okay? All right, I'm, uh, I have uh, about eight minutes. Okay, let's, let's, let's quickly rush to the last part. So uh, why, do you, why do we want to think of using this? Of course, apart from the motivation of the real problem that we have in machine learning, is also that we know that uh, there are ways, there are solution methods for ML, MILP problems that we can also leverage, okay? So the MILP formulation can be solved to global optimality, okay? Which is, which is of course, uh, something that you don't, uh, you cannot guarantee for the gradient descent methods that are being used for solving deep nets, okay? You can get a solution, but is that solution a local minimum or global minimum is not guaranteed. But these IP problems are like, you can use classical solvers like Cplex or Groby, and you are guaranteed that you're getting the global solution. And these uh, solvers are using exact methods like branch and bound methods or cutting plane or decomposition methods. We know this, there are theoretical guarantees that shows that you can you will get the global solution. But also if you want to get uh, quick solutions, you might use heuristics, okay? They are in, in heuristic solutions or methods or approaches that exist for this MILP problem that we can also use, actually be used in this paper, okay? There's what is called the mountain climbing procedure, which would iteratively uh, optimize over the U's and then the W variables in a quadratic formulation, for instance. And some more details about this, this, this MILP algorithms. So data, the, the, the one we just proposed in this paper, one thing is data points can be iteratively added to the formulation. You know, you remember the algorithm is you put in, you pick a data point and you try to minimize this problem. Okay, and you do this over all the data points, okay? So instead of having, so remember here, instead of saying, okay, remember this is gonna be for each I, right? So you're gonna have I1 up to IM, okay? Instead of doing all that in one go, you can start with one data point and incrementally you are updating, you know, so this, this would solve a memory problem, for instance. So there could be clever implementations to solve memory issues, okay? And, the other thing about uh, uh, um, 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 IP uh, methods is that uh, they try to solve uh, uh, primal and dual formulations of the problem. And in that case, what happens is they can, they can monitor the gap between the primal and dual. And as soon as the primal and dual objectives have, uh, have uh, the primal and dual uh, objective coincide, which would be like the gap between them is zero then you have got your global solution, okay? So that's one thing good about them. You can monitor the optimality gap. When that gap is zero, then you're done. You find you've got a, the, the global solution, okay? Of course, um, uh, we could say that 
uh, um, the number of integer variables are bounded by d k m, like we said. Each each i each each x is is one to m, and we have uh, k layers, and we have d for each uh, uh, dimension. Okay, so if you say d is the largest dimension, for instance, of all the d's, you take that, and there will be some constant time state. So it's linear in the number of data points, although it can be really huge. And practically, this you can you would definitely see. Okay. They are very hard to solve, but uh, we could use uh, this uh, uh, big M constraint methods, but even these ones are also hard to solve, okay? Then there are other variants. The good thing is you can, vary, you can look at different variants of this model that can be applied to different problems, okay? So the variants of the MLP models would include regression variants, you know, you could also include some quadratic loss functions, you can add regularizer, you can do multi-class classification, and you can use more general binary activation function. This is what I was referring to earlier, uh, where now you're saying alpha should be less than some lambda. Uh, if, if that happens, you have, a, you have this activation function outputting beta k, otherwise it will output gamma k, okay? So where you include lambda in your training, so you learn these lambdas that would give you best activations, okay? You can do a different ones. You can add sparsity constraints, and then you can use robust optimization approaches, which would make uh, the models more robust to noise, which is uh, uh, what uh, attempts to solve this uh, non-robustness in, in, in these kinds of algorithms that I mentioned earlier, okay? So yeah, so actually I had a slide on this robustness. You can enforce robustness during training by saying, um, you can come up with some uncertainty sets U, okay? One to M for each data point, you wanna create some set around this data point, some ball around the points, and include that in your optimization. Like you say, my X, you remember we had W1 times X1. So I, I come up with these deltas around which you say that, now I'm gonna train this algorithm so that it would satisfy this constraint. So if somebody perturb a noise, as long as that noise is within uh, this uh, level, is within uh, R, R, like if you take the, the norm of the noise is bounded by this RI for that particular data point, this, this algorithm will still predict the correct class, okay? So you could do that. So you could add that into your, your, your algorithm formulation and you could come up with a model that is more robust to noise. So this is why we argue that these models are, could be robustified and you can use techniques from robust optimization to solve this kinds of problem. Of course, the formulation becomes this two-stage robust counterpart of the BDNN and that is what you would be solving. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's discuss how useful this are. Okay, is this just theory or can we apply them? So we try to do some simulations. Okay, let's first of all put things into context. So we compared the binary deep network and the, a standard uh, deep neural network, okay? Okay, standard deep neural network. In this case, we just considered a two layer neural network because we were able to only train a two layer BDNN. Of course, like I said, the, the more layers you have, then the more complicated things become, okay? So we had uh, a ReLU activation. We used softmap on the last layer. We didn't use biases. Uh, we used the binary cross entropy and we used Adam for the learning rate, okay? Which is for the updating our learning rate, okay? So for some of you who are familiar with this, right? So our, 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 our our sum, the summary of our model is it would have 10,000 parameters and it would have uh, this number of uh, uh, neurons, okay? In the BDNN, it's the same architecture. We have input layer, one middle layer, and one output layer, like here. The output layer is just the size of, of, of the classes you want to output. The input layer is the, size, the input of the size of your input. So this is just the middle layer, which is 10. So the two is the size of your output here, okay? So we also use a heuristic BDNN where we do this mountain climbing thing to solve the BDNN and we call it BDNN heuristic. So we compare these three, BDNN, BDNN heuristic and the DNN. And here is the results. But first let's, let's talk about what, we did it in two kinds of data sets. First, we randomly generated data of dimension, vectors of dimension 100, okay? Uh, and these are the entries of these vectors are lying between some intervals in the real line and they overlap a little bit. Okay. And the idea would be now to classify this 
into two, two separate classes, okay, of roughly size 100. We did a 10 test split of 80 versus uh, 20. And this is the output that you see. For accuracy, you see that the deep neural network is the blue line. It's doing well. It's beating all this. It's 80 something percent, almost 90 percent, okay, as expected, okay. But we see that the others are not doing terribly bad, apart from here, probably. They're not doing as good, though, but yeah. Again, this is randomly generated data. What, what do we expect? The, uh, the surprising thing is this, the heuristic algorithm is doing much better than the, the, the actual uh, uh, BDNM, okay? And you can see. What we expected to gain from the heuristic is to solve, to have, uh, to, to, to have uh, uh, faster uh, input, imputations. It would have a, a faster, uh, to solve the problem faster than the actual uh, MILP formulation. Okay, but in addition to faster, it got better results, but actually it didn't get faster. Unfortunately, you could see, and this is because the problem dimension was small, we argue. Like you could see, if you look at the run times here, it's almost the same run time with the, the original BDNM. Okay, the deep network was running much faster. This is run time in seconds. Okay, and then we applied it on a real data set. Uh, there's this uh, Wisconsin uh, data set. This has nine attributes. So this, the vectors we're talking about would have dimension nine. And the number of uh, data points is 699. Uh, and it's two classes. It's, it's, it's a cancer data set, there are two classes to say it's, it's either the cancer is malignant or benign, okay? So when we run this and we have this, this result. So we have BDNN like we saw earlier and BDNN heuristic. We also have BDNN zero, so here, is I told you about this uh, choice of, of, of this uh, activation where we have uh, uh, the general setting where we set alpha to be less than uh, lambda k as the condition. And we learn this lambda k. We include this lambda k in the training. And if lambda k, if alpha is less than lambda k, we have one, zero and one otherwise. So we set gamma to, to gamma k to one and beta k to zero. And only thing is now, if lambda k is zero, we have BDN zero. If lambda k is part of the training, we have just BDN. So in this part of the, 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 the experiment, that's what we have. We have inputs of size nine, and then we choose two different middle layer sizes, 25 and 50. And we saw the accuracies vary. And the good thing is we could also tell what was the, the, the optimality gap for the uh, uh, MILP algorithms. And we, we, we got optimality gaps of zero in this case. But BDN heuristic, again, is doing far better than we expected. It's getting 95% accuracy, more than even the DNN in this setting. And if you increase the, 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 the dimension of the middle layer, we see that the, the BDN and all the other algorithms became a bit worse which is something we, we were surprised. You have this instability as to the number of layers. Again, because the problem becomes larger again to solve and so on. And BDNN still maintain what the DNN to in, win in this case. And even the, 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 even the lambda zero setting, we couldn't close the optimality gap to zero. And then what we did was take this data, shuffle it uh, randomly 10 times and do some averages. You see, we see that the BDNN is doing again very well compared to the DNN. And that was our experiment. And I will conclude by saying we saw a result of a mixed integer formulation of, uh, of the BDNN, of training the BDNN. And we have a, a, a heuristic variant which has high accuracy on real data. And we saw how you can enforce robustness during training by using robust optimization methods. There are a lot of open problems. I just mentioned a few. The derivation of more tractable formulations, how to remove this big M notation uh, methods and use other methods, it's one of them. And using more general discrete activations to increase complexity of the network or can integer progressive formulation be used to understand expressivity of network. This is also another challenge in, 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 in neural networks. And the paper was this one. I, I thank you all for your attention and any questions. Thank you very much uh, for that very interesting talk. And now we have uh, around 10 minutes for questions. Please, uh, uh, anyone want to wish to ask a question, you can uh, raise your hand and unmute your microphone. Okay, uh, thank you, Bubaka, for your presentation. It was a really nice presentation. 
and uh, I have uh, two questions. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, my first question is that I read on the literature that we can use some method like uh, uh, page to differential method to learn some kind of uh, problem where the forward path is given as a linear program. So I would like to know uh, the distance between uh, your method and this kind of method, because I think uh, we use them to solve the same kind of problem. And, uh, yeah. and uh, my second question is that- Okay, uh, let's do your first and then we come back to your second, okay? Okay, thank you. So what did you call the method again? Say repeat the method. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, Say that again. The perturbate differentiable method. Maximum perturbated method, something like Maximum that. Maximum perturbated method. Yeah. This is used for robustifying the neural networks. You mean? I would assume. Yes. Be, uh, yes. We use this kind, uh, this uh, this uh, method to in machine learning to, uh, to solve uh, some problem where the forward path can be written as a linear program. Oh. But the forward pass is very straightforward, right? The forward pass is just a multiplication. But like you said, yes, we could, we yes. could write it as a linear program because it involves uh, this activation function, right? Yes. Oh, okay. But what do they get? So um, to, do they get uh, just a linear program or a mixed uh, integer linear program? Because those two are different. Uh, the problem is that in, in this method, they introduce some kind of another module uh, mm -hmm. where, where uh, they transform, where uh, uh, they create two modules, the forward mm -hmm. pass and the backward module by adding mm -hmm. some noise in the input. Oh. And after nice. do some computation that I don't really know. But the uh -huh. thing is that uh, at the end, uh, mm -hmm. they give some solution to the initial problem. Interesting. And so I don't know. Uh, Do you know the author? Is it not one of these guys here? Uh, no, the author was uh, Kenteng Betle. Let me write it on the chat. I read this presentation from. Okay, this guy. Is, so I know this Pechetti and guys are working on this, but there's also Bastimus and his group in. in at MIT, doing something in that area. Oh, to the yeah, so they are different. They are, they, like I said, they are different approaches. Ours is not the first approach to solve, to reformulate this as a linear program and solve it. But again, I am suspecting what you're referring to is that because they are this maximum perturbation. Again, this is exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about robust. You know, you want to say, I want to perturb this. What is the maximum perturbation? So maybe you can involve even learning what is the maximum uh, R that you can have, for instance, in their formulation? I, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of the work, so I cannot say for certain, but I'm suspecting is doing with robust optimization. So that when you take a point, you find the maximum perturbation, you can perturb the points without changing the, pre the, pre the prediction of your model. So that in, in a, when you now have an adversarial attack, as long as that adversarial attack is within the maximum possible perturbation that you train your model, still your prediction would remain the same. Okay. That's what they're trying to do. Okay, what was your second question? Okay, uh, my second question was about the application of this method. And could you think that we, uh, we can use this uh, BDNN to solve some classical problem in computer science like uh, the the NASA problem with a binary variable. Mm -hmm. um, you don't call it a BDNN at that point. You know, it, uh, I think they are mixed integer linear programming formulation of the NAPSA, NAPSA problem. I think. Yes. Yes. So I think you can. Yeah, they are. It might be linear. So it might be an integer programming or a mixed integer programming problem. It might not be linear. Um, it could be quadratic or it could be even non-linear, but it could be on quadratic. So, but yeah, those people are interested in using these methods, these kinds of methods in the NAPSA program, yes. 
Wow. And the good thing is, I think people have made progress in these because one is with these uh, very exact methods and these global optimality guarantees of, of, of solvers like Groby and, and Cplex, when you can formulate the problem as a mixed integer linear program or a mixed integer quadratic program, you can solve it using these this solvers. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that question. Uh, I think we've got a few minutes for one more question. Anybody wishes to query any question or make any comments? All right. Uh, thank you for, for the presentation. Uh, I just want to know, like, how big uh, was your data? Uh, and also, what are some of the challenges that you encountered when you were trying to implement the this uh, machine learning model? Because I understand, um, you know, there are um, a lot of issues behind the implementation itself. So probably if you can explain them, uh, one or two will be able to get something. Correct, thank you. So we, we looked at two data sets, like I said, one we randomly generated where we look at um, an interval, I think it's between 10 and zero and 10. We generate, we, we generate these vectors of dimension 100 where one third of the entries, uh, uh, the entries are between zero and 10 and the other class are between minus 10 and zero. But then we created uh, another, we, we, we sampled between minus one and one and added that to each of the sets so that you can find that these two, these, these two sets overlap, okay? You could say uh, each of them is, so you have one going from minus 10 to one, generating the, the entries of the one class between minus 10 and one generating the entries of the second class between minus one and 10, okay? So there's this overlap between these two sets uh, in this region of minus one and one, okay? So we generated those and we had those two classes, one, each of them roughly 100, but so we have 200 points altogether. So that was our data. So it was just numerical values between uh, minus 10 and one, or between minus, uh, minus one and 10 for those, for those sets, so 200 of them. In the, in the Wisconsin data set, this is a data set about cancer and our breast cancer to be, to be precise. And they measure different things about the cancer, the breast cancer, the cancer tumor, okay? They look at like the area, uh, the elongation and all that. So it's measured, so different kind of attributes they measure, nine different attributes, okay? And they recorded this in cancer patients. And they have also the classes, the levels that say the patient that we measure was that cancer malignant or was it benign, okay? So you have the class levels, M or B. So this is why I highlighted M or B there, which would of course change to binary zero or one or minus one and one. So there were 69, oh sorry, 699 patients in that data set. So that is about the data. The models, I said, they, there was the deep learning model, which was just one layer neural network. The input is always the size, the dimension of your data set. Okay, in the first case, the dimension was 100. So you have 100 neurons in the first layer. The middle layer, we put 100 neurons, D1, yeah, you can see it's 100 neurons also. And the last layer is only two neurons because we are predicting two classes, okay? The same formulation we applied to make a fair comparison, we take the same formulation for the, uh, the, the BDNN, the binary deep neural network, where now this problem we are solving, where is it? This problem we are solving here, we would consider um, N, being uh, each of the axes being n of size n, and each of the uh, the dimension here is being sign n, and the number m is two hundred, and the layer, the middle layer, which is d one m m m one m m two in that case, that corresponds to m two d one, 
would be 100. So remember, so the dimensions, uh, the, the size of this problem will be now D times M times K times some constant, okay? So the dimension okay, of the middle layer you. was 100, okay? Okay, thanks for, for that. Uh, I think we're running out of time. Just uh, there was a chat, there's some, uh, there's a comment in the chat. Thanks for the overview from Benson. Are they good GPU solvers for linear programs? Uh, okay. I'm not sure. Most of the, 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 the solvers uh, are using uh, are using multi-core, they are parallelized, they're using multi-cores. So I wouldn't be surprised if there are people working on implementing them in GPUs, on GPUs. But I, I know they're using multi-core processors to, to, to run. Thank you, thank you, oh, Abuka. Um, that was very nice uh, talk and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again and I hope uh, there'll be more people involved in this uh, area of research because there's a huge demand uh, in this uh, data science. Absolutely. And I think we should look forward to, to organizing a workshop and maybe that'll be the future. Maybe the center can do that. So we'll be in contact yeah. with you and other people mm -hmm. interested because there's huge demand from industry and of course from academia. And there's a lot of challenges and opportunities, like you said, and I thank you very much and uh, all the very best. And uh, we hope to hear from you again very soon. Thank you. All and thank right. you, everybody, for participating. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Bye.